All right, welcome back everyone. Do I sound? Yes, I see thumbs up, okay. Um, so, very good. Um, the week is almost over, so that's exciting. Hope you're as excited about this as I am. So today, um, today I thought we we're gonna do things um, a little differently from what we've done so far. Um, and I guess the, the motto of today's class is uh, great artists steal. I'm sure you've heard this before. It's sort of one of these common quotes that gets misquoted left and right. Um, there's too many sources to really be able to pinpoint who started this, but um, it's been attributed to all kinds of famous people. So the idea is um, uh, that uh, I think much like uh, they're referring to artists here. I think also researchers, uh, great researchers steal. Um, so what do I mean by this? I mean that you sort of see some um, good examples of something and you sort of internalize them and their fundamentals. You absorb all of that and you kind of adapt them to your problem and your context and your domain and, uh, and whatever. Uh, and um, sort of use them as a, as a template, if you will, as a recipe. So today we're gonna uh, look at a lot of examples of what I think are some great interview studies uh, with this hidden goal of um, kind of conveying this template for sort of how to carry out and report on a great study that involves interviews. So that's sort of, that's the plan. Um, so um, hopefully we can talk a little bit about the interview guides. If you've had a chance to think about this before, um, I'd love to see at least an example of this that we could sort of discuss as a, as a group and um, so sort of see if you have any feedback for each other on that. Um, and then the, the rest of class today, uh, we're gonna have a mini workshop where we're gonna dissect these exemplar papers um, and they're like most minute details uh, and we'll see if we can learn anything from, from this. It's something that we could take home and apply in our own research. Um, just to remind you, the, um, I asked you, I think last week to write a small uh, blog post about a paper that you've read. And those are ideally due today. So hopefully you have been working on those. I have received some of them already. So thank you for people that have submitted them already. And I look forward to seeing the, the other ones. There's no class next week, Tuesday because of break day. I think you know this. So we're only gonna see each other next week, Thursday, like Tuesday's off. Um, they don't have spring break this semester. I think you know that. And it's sort of distributed random break days throughout the semester. And I think one of those is next week, Tuesday. So that affects our class, of course. So there's not gonna be class on Tuesday. We'll just sort of skip that and you can take a day off and do whatever, uh, just sleep, catch up on sleep, whatever, watch your shows. And I'll see you on Thursday instead. So there's no class on Tuesday. Um, also, by the way, speaking of scheduling and, and calendars, there have been millions of these emails, I'm exaggerating, uh, asking uh, instructors for uh, understanding and lenience with deadlines and assignments and, and things like this that have to do with um, the, the calendar and the overall university schedule. Uh, if by any chance I uh, assign you homework or whatever when I shouldn't assign you homework, you should tell me right away. I'm not doing that on purpose. Uh, it's just that I sort of haven't, uh, maybe I've missed one of these memos that was asking me not to do that. So you just if you notice that I'm asking you to work when I shouldn't be asking you to work, let me know right away and we can we can change that, okay? Um, all right, oh, and uh, important, the I do want you to do something for next week, Thursday. So next time I see you in class, and that is to read two chapters from um, a book. I posted the uh, to PDF versions of those chapters and this Google Drive folder that I just shared with you. Um, if you are not in the Slack channel already, the one that we've been using so far, please join that. I'm sort of posting all kinds of announcements and links and materials there. So please join or monitor the Slack channel um, to, to get these. 
So I've posted a link to a Google Drive folder in the Slack channel. Um, make sure you can access that. And I have posted the two chapters that I want you to read for Thursday next week under the qualitative analysis subfolder. You'll find that there. Um, the idea is that we will, so today we're gonna to talk more about, or look at examples of um, interview study designs and so the mechanics and specifics of designing and carrying out these interviews. And next time I see you in class on Thursday next week, we're gonna talk about the analysis of the data that you, you're collecting this way. So we'll talk about so qualitative analysis, grounded theory, stuff like this. Um, and uh, there's a lot to cover there. So that's why I want you to do this reading before class. So we're all on the same page and we can sort of discuss uh, more specific things and, and summarize the readings in class together, but we won't have time to cover everything. There's just too much material. So I want you to do the reading before you come to class next week, Thursday. And I posted a PDF, so you, <clears throat> excuse me, so you can find the materials easy. Any questions on any of this? Administrative things? Okay, uh, so let's see. So does anybody want to volunteer? Um, hopefully um, you've had a chance to draft something or think about the uh, the interview guide for so this uh, scenario that I asked you to think about that was to remind you um, so scientific collaboration or research collaborations uh, uh, collaborations on, on writing papers on, on research projects and so on and um, I, I asked you to think about kind of a short interview guide that would allow you to answer some interesting research questions around this so let's see, does anybody, so is anybody brave enough to volunteer an, an example of this or, or some parts of their uh, interview guide, some questions? You know, how would you start? What questions would you ask? What probes would you ask? Has anybody thought about this? There's no right or wrong answer, so, you know, any any example is good. I just want to uh, have something concrete to discuss. Remember, uh, concreteness is useful. Yeah, so um, I sort of wrote down a couple of questions. And um, um, yeah, just to sort of give a little bit of a preview, I did include the questions um, which involve like the two poles. So what are the benefits to academic collaboration and what are the drawbacks? So each are separate questions and that ideally gives some reasoning as to why people do it in the first place, but also why it's not more like, very widespread. Cool, thank you. Well, maybe let's take one small step back. What's the overall research question you have chosen to address with this? What are you trying to answer? Yeah, so it was um, the, just purely the, um, the prompt, which is understanding of how and why academic researchers collaborate on writing papers. So um, I didn't have a specific uh, sort of area in mind. Mm -hmm. I guess I was mostly thinking of uh, professors or postdocs in that sort of area, but uh, yeah. Do you, did you sort of assume any of these motivations or a different motivation still from the ones mentioned? Sort of like, wh why are you doing this? Are you doing this because you're looking to build some new collaborative software tool? Are you doing this because you're just interested in the phenomenon and you're trying to build some theory? You know, what, what, whatever that might be, what's the, what's the motivation for doing this? Yeah, so for me, motivation, because I personally don't understand it too much. So it was just to find out more about it and why people in general, like across many fields. So not necessarily, you know, within computer science or technology, just why people collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, one of my early questions was, um, how did you become an academic researcher? Which is, was to give like, get some context on uh, the areas, the area that they belong in and any possible connections they have, which may influence um, the people that they work with just to get a little bit of background on how they got there and um, if that has any sort of effect on the people that they work with as a result. Interesting, I see. Um, because you sort of expect that it might change the collaborators people choose based on their sort of how they ended up in, in research or in academic research. Yeah, I was curious if that, if that happens. 
I feel like network, I mean, I, yeah, I haven't looked into, but I feel like networking and the people you know influences a lot. Mm -hmm. Who you choose to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. So th that, that seems good. Um, I, I, I like the theory here behind this, the assumption that um, so pe people's, I don't know, background and or social networks and or professional networks are likely to influence how they choose collaborators and how they work collaboratively with others. That seems, seems good, seems like um, it's worth exploring. I'm not sure if the, um, the question you're starting from, so how did you end up in academia? I'm not sure if that's maybe too far removed from what you're actually trying to get at. Does anybody have any thoughts on any of this? This sounds good to me in general. What do you do next? Uh, so how, how do you get into more specific things? What things do you get into? What kinds of questions do you ask? Um, so I asked, uh, can you tell me about the last time you collaborated with other researchers on a paper? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so they have a recent memory um, and a specific ex example that they could go into. And then I also ask if you've never collaborated before, why not? Because, you know, that might also be an option. Um, yeah, and then I basically asked about benefits, drawbacks, um, if they could tell me about a positive experience as a collaborator and a negative one. Mm -hmm. And um, also, do you think you will collaborate more or less in the future and why, why not? Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and then I finish off with, um, is there anything else you think uh, we should know about your involvement in academic collaboration? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, great. Thanks a lot, that was great. Um, a Let, let's see, any thoughts on, on Hannah's questions and prompts? Yeah, I'm wondering if um, maybe different people consider different things collaboration than they normally would. Uh, for example, professors are often collaborating with their students, but they might not consider that academic collaboration. Mm. Uh, and so maybe uh, an initial question of what do you consider academic collaboration or, uh, or something like that, just to, to get at the idea of what it means in the first place. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, on Jeremy's follow-up thoughts or Hannah's earlier thoughts? Any other thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's valid. Having them like define collaboration is probably very good like towards the beginning of the interview because it sets up probably like following probes and gives a little bit more uh, scope to the interview. One thing that comes to mind I so I agree with the in, intent there um, behind Jeremy's comment. I I'm not sure about the form. I, I don't know if so asking so the, the way the way it was phrased right. So how how do you define or, or something like this? How do you define academic collaboration? That's sort of very abstract, right? So it's kind of counter to the best practice I, I kept mentioning to, to make things specific and concrete. So I wonder if you could sort of tie this more into, um, into how you started, Hannah, with you know, thinking of the most recent research project where you collaborated with others, right? There you could ask, you know, what was your role in that collaboration and what did the other people do, right? So this would sort of I think get at maybe the same thing. Like, what is it that, so obviously you consider that to be a collaboration, right? Because you're the one that chose the example. I'm not in, uh, imposing my example on you. You, know, you were free to maybe choose uh, the example, right? So the most recent project where you collaborated with others, right? And, and you choose which one you want to talk about, right? So obviously you consider that to have been a collaboration and, and you consider sort of yourself to have been a collaborator in, in that, that's kind of, uh, implied, I guess, and you could ask probably, you know, what is it that, what was your role in that collaboration? You know, could you tell me more about what you did, what the other people did, and, and so on. Like this, describe, walk me through it, walk me through that project, walk me through that paper writing or whatever it is. If you want to focus on the writing aspect as opposed to the research um, development more generally. So maybe that's sort of one way to um, take Jeremy's 
comment and intent, which I thought was good, and make it a little bit more concrete so that maybe people are less likely to, I don't know, invent things that they think you want to hear and maybe just sort of tell you more uh, true things. What else do people think? Thanks for that, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm also wondering like how to ask this question. Maybe a comparison to describe, compare it to work where you didn't collaborate with someone or something like this, just to get at the definition of what they think they, where they think they collaborated and did without actually asking them directly. All right, so if, if I, I don't know, if I'm a professor, does that mean that, and I, I don't know, I tell the student what to do, uh, is that a collaboration or is it more, I don't know. Are we... Yeah, I mean, when's the last time you were the only author on a paper? Mm. It's, it just rarely happens. What else comes to mind? Any so other questions you've thought of asking or comments on the questions you've heard so far? So, so I have a question. So, so let's kind of switch the context a little bit. Like, let's assume that we we want to kind of design a new collaboration tool. And I was wondering, is it necessary to ask the question that you have experience on collaborating with others, writing a paper? Because if the if the interviewee answers like no, mm -hmm. then there's kind of there's no need to get input from from them, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm 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 trying to design a collaboration tool. Yeah, thanks thanks uh, uh, CJ for that. I was actually uh, thanks for reminding me. I was going to sort of uh, comment on this too. Uh, I think Hana, you mentioned uh, something along the lines. Um, if you haven't collaborated or, or, or you are going to ask something about about so people that haven't collaborated. So I think so. Yeah. This is the right. What, what was the question? Uh, if you have never collaborated before, why not? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this I think ties into what CJ is asking. Um, one thought that comes to mind is you could probably address this. You, the researcher, could probably address this um, through your recruitment mechanism. So I, I think I agree with CJ here. Um, you know, if you're trying to build a tool to support collaboration between, I don't know, uh, authors on a research paper, then probably you need input from people that are authors collaborating on research papers or have been authors collaborating on research papers. Uh, their input would be more useful to you than input from people that have never collaborated with other authors on writing a research paper. Right, if your goal is to build a tool to better support them. So it seems to me like you could um, bake this into your uh, recruitment uh, so sampling strategy to ensure that the sample of participants you end up interviewing are all people that have um, collaborated or, or co-authored a research paper at the very least that you could start from that. You could start from uh, an initial sample of co-authors on research papers, right? So these are people that are likely to have collaborated. Uh, and like, obviously they may have not done any writing, right? There's other contributions that, uh, that people make on a research project that aren't writing, uh, that sort of weren't authorship on a research paper. So they may still have not collaborated on the writing aspects of the paper, but otherwise collaborated on the research project. So um, you could you could have a screening you know um, set of questions or question when you invite them for the interview right before you actually when you're looking to schedule an interview with them you could screen them to make sure that they um, satisfy these criteria that are important for your study goals right so you know they, they have to have collaborated on writing for example if, if that's the goal here CJ. Right, and otherwise you just don't interview them because they you expect that their input is not as useful for this particular goal. Yeah, good point. 
Anything else that comes to mind? Like, have you thought of any other, other questions that you wanted to ask? Well, depending on what the point of the interview is, you may want to ask some more specific questions. Like, if the goal is the tool, then you could ask something like, what are your favorite features of the current tool that you use? You know, which ones are your least favorite? Something like that. Something a lot more specific to get at your research question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, one uh, caveat is you probably want to um, avoid assuming that they are using certain tools, right? So I guess establish the validity of the assumptions before going into the specifics, right? So for example, you know, you could ask, how are you currently collaborating on, on editing a paper? And what tools, if any, are you using, right? And then, and then you could sort of go into, you know, what, what is it in specifically about this tool that that you like or hate or something right so to avoid assuming that they are using a certain tool or uh, tools in general right they, they may just work in very different ways maybe they um write comments on paper right maybe the i don't know one of the co-authors prints out a, a draft and they comment on it on paper and they sort of uh, give that back to the other co-author without using any particular tool, right? So um, you sort of want to establish their workflow and, and so on before asking about so specific features of tools. All right, yeah, thanks. So this, this was, I think you get the idea now, you get the idea for sort of how to, um, to think about these and, and sort of how to formulate questions. Um, so I think, I think this is good for now, so we can move on. Thank you for all of these, this was very useful. All right, so what I'd like to do in the uh, remainder of class today is, is literally this, is, is sort of dissect a bunch of um, research papers that I think are good examples of using interviews um, and try to extract the essence of, of why they're, they're good examples, right? And so hopefully by the end of this, we'll all have this sort of shared understanding of, uh, well, first of all, that, that these are good examples. And, and second, sort of what about them in particular makes them good examples? So what I've done is I have um, selected, I don't know, six, seven papers um, I think I've already mentioned a few of them uh, before, and I've asked you if at all possible to take a look at them before class. Um, I, I don't remember how many of them I've asked you to, to look at. But um, in any case, let's look at them now together. So this is going to be very hands-on and very discussion-focused, and, and that's what I'm planning on doing, so just you know, dissecting these different things, uh, papers, uh, in the remaining hour or so. All right, very good. Welcome back. So let's see what we've got, huh? What did you think? Did you like any anything you've read? Matt? Oh, you can be honest. Matt is fine. I'm seeing, uh, uh, maybe. Okay, let, let's see. So um, hopefully you'll get the idea by the end why I think these are good examples. So let's see. Uh, what kinds of questions do they ask? Like, what is the type of research question they ask? How about, has anybody read the teen instant messaging paper? Like, what's the idea there? What was the question? Um, we haven't, uh, our group haven't gone to that paper. We, we read the other two. Okay, let's. I I actually read this one. I'm glad that you included it because it was a lot of fun. Uh, so it's in like 2002, which is when I was a teen using instant messaging. So it was kind of a wild uh, look back. I thought uh, 
what was really interesting is they, the researchers weren't even sure like how continuously people were using instant messaging at the time. Um, they uh, talked to both college students and high school students, I think, mm -hmm. and people that owned their own hardware and had family shared hardware because that was common at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so they had to categorize people by how often they even use things. They had these two discrete and continuous categories. So mm -hmm. just asking how often do you use it for how long, um, when you're online, when you're using instant messaging uh, apps, how many people do you talk to typically in a session? How long is a session? This is interesting because it's not even like something that we think about anymore. Like, so I, I guess another to, to kind of abstract all from that, uh, they had, um, there was this new phenomenon, right? That you know, people were instant messaging, but um, nobody had any idea how a certain group of, of the population, uh, um, in this case, teenagers, uh, young adults, whatever, uh, they had no idea how these people were, if at all, instant messaging. Like, were they doing it? What were they doing as part of it? How were they doing it? Just nobody knew what was going on. So you can see sort of, uh, why a qualitative study, and in this case using interviews, why that was a good choice of method given this research question. They just had no idea even what to measure, right? They wouldn't even know where to start. So it's a very good way to get some insights into a, a new phenomenon. By the way, side note, um, does anybody remember, uh, we talked about lit reviews, I don't know, a, a couple of uh, lectures ago. Does anybody remember I mentioned some so useful heuristic for thinking about and structuring lit reviews. What was that? Do you remember? It was like three keyword heuristic. Problem. Gap and hook. Yes, that's it. Thank you. So what's the problem? What's the gap in knowledge? And why is it important to fill that gap? Who cares? What's the hook? That's the hook. Who cares if we fill that gap? Okay, so um, as a side note, kind of this is um, looking at these papers or one level uh, above still, looking at the writing in general, look how well, I, I think you will agree, all of them have achieved this. And they're all very good examples of this uh, use of the problem gap hook heuristic for uh, motivating the study. So here they talk about how um, this new phenomenon was on the rise and was getting media attention. Um, and we, we have no idea how and why teens use instant messaging. Uh, and this is a sort of very um, interesting and uh, active area of research. Um, and it's really important. So that's the hook, here's the hook, right? They talk about this explicitly, like three potential uh, insights, the three implications of knowing this. Um, we uh, so can um, uh, understand how this collaborative IT technology is, is kind of being adopted into the home. We can, um, uh, this has implications for, for how people maintain their uh, privacy and are, have this sort of dual public private um, nature online and, and offline. Uh, and because these teens are going to be the workforce of the future, uh, e.g. Jeremy, uh, who is now part of the workforce, um, then we sort of, we'd better sort of know what they're doing with this kind of technology because they will have to be using all of this similar technology in the workplace uh, uh, soon. So like lots of sort of important implications of, of doing this, that's the hook, right? This is why we care about this. Okay, uh, great. What about the whiteboard diagrams paper? Does anybody, has anybody read that? What was the question? Yeah, Main so question. Um, our team read that one. And main question was, um, a lot of software developers use the whiteboard to kind of like sketch out ideas and also um, Kind of represent their code at a high level, but um, people, I guess we didn't we didn't really know why and how they create these diagrams, and also it seems a little bit odd because um, we also it's like a like a um the code that we write is a 
it's a textual representation when we and then but when we talk about it, it's more of a visual representation um so they wanted to kind of ask questions or i guess the research questions they asked were like how do engineers use the diagrams and work why do they use them what are like the conventions that they use and what's the culture around these drawings mm -hmm. what's the hook um the hook or what's yeah what's the gap you've sort of mentioned this the gap or the problem is um people use diagrams in sort of engineering disciplines but we have no idea how and why uh people use diagrams in software engineering as as one type of engineering discipline uh, and we have some good reasons to suspect that software engineering might be different from other disciplines and you've mentioned this um, you've mentioned how uh, people usually sort of write code in their editors and they you know, they don't think about sort of design necessarily they, like the, the primary medium for software engineering is is text in an editor it's not uh, a drawing unlike i don't know um, mechanical engineering perhaps where there's a lot more design and, and things like this or architecture whatever um but so w why do we care about this what's the hook i think they, they they plan to understand how and why developers use these diagrams and then develop tools to support to better support this process i think that's it that's it exactly right so if if you're um going to build tools to support developers who are doing this if you're going to build things to build tools you had better know how and why they're using diagrams in the first place because otherwise how would you know what to build and how to build it if you have no idea why people are doing this in the first place right so you need to have this sort of, uh, grounded understanding of how and why and when and, and and so on people use these diagrams if you have any hope of building the right tools otherwise chances are you'll build the wrong tools that uh, nobody cares about yeah so that that's it that's the hook um all right so some quotes from the paper um you can you can refer to these later uh, later if you want as kind of uh, these are just my notes from from reading the papers myself uh all right what about the security folk uh, folk models uh paper Is any of the groups read that one? If you say no, it's fine. We move on to the next one. But I, I need some feedback. I, I can't see all of you, and I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'm guessing this is a no, so we'll skip this one. What about the social coding paper? Yeah, so uh, Simon and I had this paper and uh, yeah, I've read this paper before. And so um, it lays out the research questions or the, you know, sort of the gap in knowledge pretty well. And it, what it essentially comes down to is little is understood about the inferences and sort of the social um, like nuances of information how people you know look at and deal with other people's profiles on github and so they do these interviews um with people of varying um sort of involvement levels and like you know different uh work environments uh just to get an idea of how they you know look at people's profiles and project profiles and what sort of decisions they make based off based off of that and um so there's a lot of like really interesting quotes and um also, you know, I remember there was one example when I was first reading the, this where um, a person was a person was looking at someone's profile and they made some inferences which turned out to be completely wrong. And so, you know, there's also this uh, idea that, you know, the information that someone displays and, um, you know, the sort of transparency has a lot of influence on, you know, how people, how possibly a maintainer or someone improving your changes may perceive you and that in turn could like affect how they you know whether they decide to merge your PR, how they're going to respond, and yeah, that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. overall, very interesting paper. How would you how would you summarize, distill the problem, the gap, and the hook? Yeah, so the problem would be that um, 
that yeah sorry uh i guess i'm having a little bit difficulty sort of differentiating between them but um the problem would be you know not a lot and yeah i guess the gap is not a lot is understood about the social cues and um the problem is that there's isn't a lot of transparency on github um with regards to profiles and you know to help people make decisions and so the hook um I'm less certain about this one, but uh, to sort of talk to these uh, people directly and see how do they make their decisions based on the information they see. The, the hook means who, who cares about this? Why should we care that the study exists? So I would say maybe the problem is that uh, these online collaboration platforms like GitHub um, make public a lot of information about yourself and, and your activity. Um, and the gap is that we just have no idea uh, what people, this is the yellow part here highlighted, what people are able to infer from such a collection of, of information and how these inferences help them carry out their work. That's the gap. We have, we have no idea. Look, and also look how beautifully this is written. What is more interesting and less understood is blah, 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 blah. Very simple and very sort of powerful uh, to, to convey the gap here. Um, and arguably the hook is that, um, these are the actual research questions, is that we need to develop this understanding of, sort of the kinds of inferences that people make because these inform the design of similar platforms for large scale online collaboration uh, and imply a variety of ways that transparency can support innovation and knowledge sharing and community building and so on. And they have an entire discussion of this at the end of the paper. But this is the this is why we care, right? So this is why the study uh, warns publishing an existence, right? Because because it has all of these implications. It's so it's important to know these things. That the, it's important to fill the gap that the, the study fills. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what about the math overflow paper? Let's skip this one uh, just because I, I want to have more time to um, talk about the technical details of the interview. But this is very similar. You see a very similar uh, scenario here. Uh, people collaborating online to solve math problems on some particular website. Uh, and um, the research question, so again, very open-ended, very kind of uh, assuming very little knowledge about this phenomenon and just sort of trying to develop some understanding of the phenomenon. How do people collaborate to solve complex, difficult math problems on this website, right? Which we have no idea, right? So how do they do this? And they have some reasons why that's important. Um, the green SE paper, um, so, uh, similar, right? So um, the, all kinds of concerns about the amount of energy that the mobile devices are using. And this is a popular research topic, but despite it being a popular research topic, we little is known about the practitioner's perspectives on, on this topic, right? So yeah, researchers care about this, but practitioners, we don't know. We don't know if and, uh, and how much they care about this. Okay? That's the gap. Um, and then they have some research questions trying to fill this gap. Like, um, what are the requirements that practitioners have about energy use and so how do they think about this and so on? Uh, and these are questions that they address. Um, and the hook is that uh, unless we understand practitioners' needs here, then we as researchers may find ourselves in the situation where despite significant investment of time and effort and resources into developing tools and techniques to uh, do green software engineering, nobody will use them in practice. Right, because we have misunderstood completely the needs that practitioners have. But this is the hook. This is why we care about this study. Okay. Um, what about the sex workers paper? Let's see. This was very interesting. I, I can do this one again. Um, this one was actually really interesting. Uh, it was basically hci for legitimate sex workers in europe uh they specifically looked at sex workers in uh it was switzerland and germany i think and 
I think like every part of this paper was interesting from like recruitment all the way to the questions they asked and they had to have consul a consultant figure out the appropriateness of questions and things like that. The problem in this paper was that uh, the sex worker industry in Switzerland and Germany is a legitimate uh, business. Uh, you have to register with the government in these countries to, to do this job. Um, and they use software, like they use um, apps on their phone and things like that. And no one has asked them about their needs and about what they uh, need in, um, in an application for designing uh, an app for them. Um, there's a ton of really interesting uh, information in here and caveats like Payment companies are typically based in the US, so uh, people have trouble with their payment accounts being locked and things like this. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's, I think that captures it well. Um, the, the problem is we don't have any empirical data about how technology is used in this context. We just, we have no idea. Uh, again, so it's one of these, you kind of see the pattern by now, I think, where the kinds of questions that are being asked in all of these studies are sort of very broad questions that one typically has uh, around a new phenomenon or around a phenomenon that there hasn't been much research on, that is not well understood and well studied. Even if it's not a new phenomenon, it's a phenomenon that's understudied. Right? So it's, it's a very powerful um, technique to use for, for these kind of questions. Um, and they have so this very well written paper, they, um, very good motivation and, and so on. Um, all right, so this was this is the hook, by the way. Um, we uh, so lots of implications. For example, uh, how technologists can better support uh, these uh, th these user groups uh, with uh, technology solutions. Right. So that's a very concrete engineering implication of this, and and others as well. Um, okay, so I think you get the idea of the, sort of the style of research questions. What about designs? Let's talk about this for, for a minute. Like, how do interviews fit into a bigger picture if there is a bigger picture? Like, what's the, what's the overall study design and how do interviews fit into that? Um, so let's see if we can go back through these. The uh, teen instant messaging paper. I guess it's me. I mean, I think the theme is common in all of these. It's like, we don't know anything about this specific uh, large problem that we're trying to study. So we need to ask the only people that we can think of who know the answers to these. Right, and they, they did a bunch of interviews with uh, some of these users, right? Um, and so an interesting nuance here, they, um, supplemented the interviews, the information they got from the interviews with some observations of the researchers that the researchers did of the online activity of these users. Okay, so um, you could think of this as a mixed method study really because it sort of, it combines the um, uh, information collected through these interviews, extracted from these interviews with this information from these empirical observations of what people actually did um, on their, uh, I don't know, IM client, okay? Um, and note also, I pulled out a quote here, note also how they um, have a very sort of clear motivation why this is an appropriate choice of method, okay? So the, the intention was to take this grounded bottom-up approach to the investigation, allowing the most common and significant issues to emerge from the inquiry with few initial expectations. So they didn't want to impose their own views on this. They just wanted sort of the, the, the theory, the whatever information to emerge from the bottom up, right? From uh, grounded in, in the actual uh, views of the participants. The, the whiteboard paper, what was the overall design like? Um, so for this one, they interviewed um, developers at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a recruitment survey mm -hmm. um, to help them basically find people who actually use diagrams in their software development process uh, for this interview. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sam. So th that's right. So this is another very interesting design here. Um, they had an initial survey um, that they sent out to um, a bunch of Microsoft engineers to identify interviewees. They didn't know who to interview, but they ran this initial survey to find out who they could interview. Okay, so this I think goes back to um, CJ's comment from earlier when we talked about the sort of collaborative paper writing um, interview. Um, and so they follow that up with semi-structured interviews with a bunch of users and um, looking at how and why and when they use diagrams. And again, interesting, interesting study design. They followed that up still with a large scale survey. So they didn't stop with the information they collected from these nine interview participants, but rather they followed up with a large survey with some I don't know, thousands of um, Microsoft engineers to um, learn more about some of these scenarios where diagrams were created to, to get more validation, triangulation information about some of these things they discovered from the interviews. Okay, so it's a very powerful design here because um, because you know their interview sample was relatively small, only nine people they ended up interviewing, right? So it could be that they got lucky or unlucky, and somehow the views of those nine people are um, very unique, right? So you know they went around this issue, potential issue, by following that up with a large-scale survey to get a lot more confidence that some of these issues that came up from the interviews are shared by lots of other people. Does that make sense? So you see sort of this combination of methods here and how one method tries to sort of help fill voids that the other creates. Um, has anybody read the security folk models paper? I think we skipped this one before, right? We didn't do this one the first time around. So let me skip this one. Uh, what about the da uh, social coding Dabish paper? Uh, yeah, so the interviews were used to get um... Yeah, some a better idea about the how people were inferring, like what people were inferring from people's profiles, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, how the transparency affected their decisions. And it's just interviews, right? Yeah, semi-structured interviews. Mm -hmm. Right. So they they did interviews with twenty-four users, um, and they analyzed this data and theorized. Um, you, we'll, we'll talk more about this on Thursday next week about so how to do this. And that's what the readings I assigned for next week, Thursday, are about so how to go from the data you're collecting uh, from these interviews to some higher level theory, or, or how do you um, go from that to a paper like the ones we've read. Uh, it's all, all, all in this qualitative analysis coding process. So you'll read about that on your own for Thursday, and we're gonna talk about this in class. Um, okay, the math overflow paper, Again, a very interesting design. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at this, um, I recommend you go back and check this. So they, um, very interesting. They start by um, the researchers, analyze the researchers themselves, analyzing a bunch of these um, math overflow questions to identify instances of uh, collaboration. They call these collaboration acts of people collaborating to solve the problem. Uh, and they build this taxonomy um, by, by doing this themselves. Then they follow up with, with interviews, okay, um, with a bunch of active users. Um, and they try to get a lot more context around those collaborative acts that they've identified in the first place. And then still, okay, they follow up with a quantitative study to see what value, if any, these different collaborative acts they've identified in the first step uh, added to the solution quality, right? Th does it matter at all? So yes, we've identified that so people engage in a bunch of collaborative acts, but does it matter at all? Like, does it have any effect on anything? Like, wh why should we care about this, right? And they're showing which ones matter and, and so how much they're quantifying how much these things matter. Okay, so you can see there's not a great example of a mixed methods design involving interviews. What about the green software engineering paper? We 
talked about this, I guess, for right? This, yeah. Uh, for this one, they did the um, same kind of process as in one of the previous ones where they first do qualitative interviews um, with like, I think around 15 participants, and then they do a large scale quantitative uh, survey of a lot more people to get quantitative data about the qualitative stuff that they learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't always need to do this, by the way, but uh, I'm sort of highlighting some possibilities here, right? For so designing studies in different ways and com combining methods in different ways, right? You've seen papers that relied solely on interviews. And that was it, the entire study was, this, um, was based on these interviews. And you've seen different versions of studies that involved interviews and other things around them, either before or after. Okay. So all of these are, are, are possibly, um, in, to, depending on the questions you're, you're looking to answer. What about the sex workers paper? This one was, again, really similar, um, ex except it was slightly more challenging to ask the questions, but uh, they had no information at all, really. Um, the researchers weren't sure what platforms they were using. Um, if they were using their own phones or a different phone or something like this. So it was very exploratory. They were uh, relatively open-ended questions, but they also needed to be very careful about what they were asking and how they were asking it. The design here is based solely on interviews, right? Yeah. Right. So, so this sort of um, concludes the section about, about design, like where do interviews fit into the, the larger design? So let's look at so some of the nitty gritty specifics next. So how they actually did these and so why we think that was good or, or I thought that was good. Um, so let's, let's go back to the, um, the teen IM paper. Um, so here's some things that so stood out uh, to me as I was reading. So first of all, the interviews, they, they say about, they talk about how they conducted in-depth interviews um, and some of them lasted three hours long. Can you imagine? That's a long interview to have, a long conversation. And they lasted at least half an hour long. They're saying between half an hour and three hours each. Okay, so really in depth, they had a chance to go over lots of things, presumably. Um, they talk about how, um, wh where the interviews took place. So they, they took place in person. And we know where they took place, they report on this. And in fact, this is really interesting. They motivate, um, so this is sort of part of their study design. They're saying their interview participants lived in regions where local economy centered on computing and telecommunications. Therefore, our assumption was that this population of people leads others in technology adoption. Uh, and the examination of such a group forecasts future practice of, of wider and more diverse populations. So, so again, this is about sampling strategy and recruitment. So very deliberate here, right? So if you're going to go somewhere to study this new problem, like where are you gonna go study this, right? Well, this is a good setting, right? You go in a place where the technology has maybe penetrated more than, than in other places, right? So that will give you more insight into how people are using it. Right, and so that forecasts how this might propagate elsewhere. So it's a very deliberate decision in how this was sort of part of their uh, sampling strategy and recruitment strategy. Um, if you want to be critical, there's a few things that you know they didn't really report on that um, were were useful to to know. I think so. They didn't really talk about how they identified these people. I, I don't think. Um, they didn't talk about how they came up with the number of 16 people to interview and so why, why that number. Um, they didn't talk about whether the subjects knew each other. That seems important because they do talk about how some of the subjects were from the same school. So they may have known each other, right? And uh, that kind of um, means that their um, um, information is maybe not independent from each other. Maybe they were just sort of IMing each other and so on. So they're kind of uh, echoing some of the same views, perhaps. So, you know, maybe from a recruitment sampling uh, standpoint, you're better off with people that are more distant from each other. Maybe they have more different views and you're learning more from that than from people that sort of uh, talk to each other because they maybe sort of will tell you the same things, right? So that's sort of one, one issue. 
um, they don't actually include the script, the interview guide. They don't, we, we can't see that, or we can't really um, comment on, on the kinds of questions they asked and so on. So just, just some thoughts. Remember, no study is perfect, right? Even these exemplar ones that I think are really great uh, are, aren't perfect. No study ever is. Um, okay, the whiteboard paper. This was, so, okay, interesting. So two authors, conducting the interview. So I think uh, somebody last time talked about how, um, you know, can you have multiple people do the interviews or does it have to be just the one? Can you like split up the work? So yeah, here they had two, two authors do interviews um, and the interviews typically lasted about 45 minutes. So again, you see like a lot of depth here. Uh, 45 minutes is a long time to have a conversation about a specific topic with a one human being, right? It's a long time. So a lot of depth. Um, they talk about the guide and so how they structured these uh, introductions. They mentioned the goals of the study. They uh, mentioned that uh, this is anonymous and that participants could decline to answer any question they wanted, that they could decide to leave to terminate the interview at any point. Um, they asked for permission to record the conversation. They asked for permission to take photographs of their diagrams and their whiteboards, right? So remember how we talked about how it's really important to put people at ease, right? At, at the beginning of an interview, right? This is a great example of how they, uh, they did that, right? They tried to make people comfortable that, um, you know, they're being um, honest and, and so on with, with ev everything. And there's no, you know, um, gotcha or, or whatever, sort of um, hidden things here. Like everything is so transparent and, and honest from the beginning. Um, right, so they do describe the guide in the paper. So you can, you can see that they talk about so specifically what the guide contained. Um, very interesting again. So note how they talk about in the paper, how they didn't ask the question sequentially, but we tried to respect the flow of the conversation uh, and all this, uh, always trying to touch at least on a couple of points from each of these topics, but they're not necessarily in a, in a fixed order and not necessarily covering everything. Right? So you can see how it's an organic thing. It's a living thing. You have this conversation with uh, a, you know, another human being and you sort of react to, to that as opposed to just a scripted thing that, I don't know, a, a robot would have been able to do in, in your stead. Okay, we didn't talk about the security folks. Uh, folk models paper. I'm gonna skip this one. You see more of the same. Um, the social coding paper. This um, int other interesting uh, things here. So here are the interviews. The, they were conducted over different mediums. So some were in person, some were by a phone. Okay. You don't have to stick to the same medium. It doesn't invalidate the, the process, right? You could use whatever's most convenient to your participants. Um, they were very deliberate and explicit, the researchers, about their recruitment and sampling here. So they, they talk about how they chose participants for equal representation across peripheral, and heavy users of the platform, okay? And they mentioned why they did this, okay? They motivate their recruitment strategy. They're saying that they did this because they thought that the two groups might have different purposes and strategies and, and very different uh, information loads, right? So it's sort of important to capture that difference here. And they, they did that very deliberately. It wasn't an accident that they uh, sort of interviewed these people. They're they very deliberate about who to interview. Um, okay, yeah, so this is interesting. So the, the interview itself, um, as part of their guide, they asked participants to walk the re interview, um, interviewers, the researchers, um, through their last session on GitHub um, and describe how they interpreted the information and uh, as they managed their projects and interacted with other people and, and so on. But, but emphasis here is walk through the last session. Okay, so a concrete specific scenario, okay, not abstracted generalities. 
B, recent, the last session. Okay, recent, so that your memory is as fresh as it could be, and therefore the information is as reliable as it could be. Okay, so very deliberate, very deliberate design of this um, interview guide here, right, to kind of uh, extract as useful as information as possible. Um, oh, even more on this. Participants shared their screen during the interview uh, and the researchers could take notes and I think they even have video recordings or something of the, the sessions um, and the participants could sort of demonstrate their activities on the site through the sort of shared screen uh, setting. Um, and um, right, so again, concrete specific, right, as opposed to abstracted generalities. I'm showing you exactly what I'm doing, what I'm clicking on, what I'm reading, what I'm inferring, and so on. And I'm walking you through this. Uh, all right, then again, you see a lot of depth, right? It's 45 minutes to one hour. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion. Um, okay, and then transcribed verbatim and analyzed. Um, okay, math overflow paper, more of the same. Um, you see the same idea here, uh, diversity of channels and mediums to conduct the interview. Some were phone, some were Skype calls or Zoom, I guess would be these days. Some were text, instant messenger or email, right? All of these together, um, I guess the participants were free to choose whichever um, medium they preferred. The, the green software engineering paper um, doesn't talk much, I think, about the, the sort of details of how they did this, but they are very explicit about their guide and the write-up, and so very deliberate about their choice of things to include in the guide, um, right? So they motivate why they included these things in their interview guide, um, why this design, and so not a different design. Right, they're different recruitment strategies, which they describe and motivate in detail. Uh, they talk specifically about sampling strategies. They are, they're saying specifically that they chose maximum variation sampling. And we, we talked about this last time. Um, super interesting. They, so, so here's a sampling uh, detail that's important. Um, they used, they, so they had some initial sample of participants which they identified through this maximum variation sampling. And they expanded on that using a snowball process, meaning um, people that they've interviewed in the first round gave recommendations of other people that would be good to interview. Okay, and they, so they kept interviewing these additional people that were recommended by the first part, set of participants until they reached saturation. And we talked about what that means. Okay, so you can you can see you can see all of these things that we talked about in uh, in practice here. Um, this was amazing. The sex workers paper, amazing. So a lot of sort of hurdles to to be able to carry this out, um, and sort of very well written, well well described um, methodology and sort of choice of of um, steps in this. So they talk about the guide. They talk about how they use the guide. Um, Oh yeah, so interesting. They talk about how the researchers lurked on some specific forums that their target uh, participants were using in order to learn the right language that their participants are using so that they could communicate with them more effectively. Um, they hired an external consultant, one of the participants, uh, one of the, uh, a member of the same group as the participants as a consultant to ensure the appropriateness of their protocol, right? So there's a lot of, look how much work they put into this and how much thought they put into this. Um, recruitment strategies, interviews, uh, linguistic issues, different communication channels. Uh, oh yeah, this is again, super interesting. End-to-end uh, -end encrypted communication channels to ensure the uh, privacy and anonymity of the participants, right? Because they're such a sensitive population, right? Look how much um, trouble the researchers went through to carry these interviews out. And they even paid participants for their time. 
Um, okay, so let me skip this. So we're we're out of time, but the summary is that um, hopefully you've seen um, some similarity in the types of questions that these papers asked. So very open-ended uh, with questions with the goal of building this bottom-up grounded understanding of theory of some phenomenon. Um, you've probably, you probably agree that we've seen quite some diversity in their study designs, right? So some studies only involved interviews and others combined interviews with other methods in sort of interesting ways. You've, you've seen that diversity. You have generally seen, I think you'll agree, very careful execution of all of these. Okay, extremely careful. Everything was sort of very thoughtful and well-motivated. Um, and very detailed, transparent reporting and writing of this, like very uh, clear motivation for uh, why every step of the uh, research was, was chosen, why any, any uh, specific design decision, sampling strategy, and so on. Um, very honest uh, acknowledgement of limitations of the study as designed. We didn't get to talk much about this. Um, and, and overall, I think you'll see, you'll agree that also very simple, straightforward writing, like not very easy to read. All of these were hopefully very easy to read papers, um, but look sort of how thoughtful and careful everything about the study design and execution was, right? Despite the simplicity of the writing. So that's, that's it, that's it for today. Um, and I will see you in, in a week and I'm happy to take questions. I, uh, I can stick around for a bit. Do you, do people agree that these were good examples? But one more thing I want to mention. Um, the, even if you don't end up doing interviews as part of your research, there's a good chance you'll end up doing something similar where all of these best practices that we talk about now in, in a lot of detail for interviews are applicable as well. So if you're doing surveys with some open-ended questions, you see a lot of this. If you're doing human studies of any kind, lab studies, you'll see a lot of the same kinds of things where you sort of have to ask people questions and you have to interpret what they're saying. So a lot of um, what you're learning about interviews, you'll see sort of carry over to lots of other um, scenarios, one. And two, um, I think between sort of, um, becoming proficient in um, a little bit of qualitative analysis, for example, the one we've been talking about for interviews, uh, and becoming proficient in a little bit of quantitative analysis, uh, which we'll talk about later. Like between these two, two very basic sets of things, you're probably covered 80% or more of all of the research that you will be doing involving empirical methods. So I think you're set to go for, for, for quite a while. So this, this is gonna be very useful. I, um, I anticipate. Anyway, uh, thanks for thanks for today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend. See you in a week.